Welcome back to Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. I'm your host, Emily Johnston, and I'll be taking you along on my journey to learn about all things genetics in extensive livestock. Last season, we explored the foundational aspects of genetics. We discussed everything from basic genetic principles to practical applications on farm. This season, we're kicking it up a notch. Today's guest is Sue Mortimer, who is a research scientist at the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. Some of the topics we're going to discuss include how to find the balance between wool production and eating quality traits, and some of her research findings in improvers carcass traits in merinos. This is an episode I can guarantee you'll want to stick around for, and one you'll enjoy. So with that, let's get into it. So welcome back to another episode of Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. Today I'm joined by Sue Mortimer, who's one of my colleagues at New South Wales DPI, and I'm very excited to sit down and have a chat to her today. So thank you so much, Sue, for jumping onto the podcast, having a chat with me. Thank you, Emily. Glad to be here. Thank you. So Sue, I guess like let's just jump straight into it. So tell me a bit about yourself. I guess, yeah, what sort of work do you do at New South Wales DPI and what sort of projects are you currently working on? Okay, Emily, I'm, I'm involved in sheep breeding research with, with the department based here in Armidale as well as spending time at Trangy. My current work is in the area of, of eating quality in, in merino sheep in particular, look, looking at how it can be improved and incorporated into merino breeding programs. At the same time, I, I have some other interests in wool production more generally as well as starting to work in the area of selection for the reduced methane emissions in, in sheep. That is a lot of work. <laughs> you it have is. a lot on your plate. <laughs> it's, it, it is broad and sometimes I think I'm probably not across any one topic in particular at the one time, but it's interesting to see how different traits work and how they are, are related to each other and how you can understand genetics behind them and be able to incorporate them into breeding programs. It sounds really valuable to be able to work across all of those different areas and look at all the different traits and see how they connect too. I'm sure that's so fascinating just to see how all of them are so linked. It is because you you get the opportunity to look at different traits, talk with people, scientists, animal production scientists, for example, who understand the biology behind how an animal functions and you're there to look at how the animals might vary in a particular aspect of, say, nutrition or or the way meat is produced and processed so that you can look at whether an aspect, a measurement, which becomes a trait in genetic terms, can can be be measured firstly in a laboratory setting or, or on a, a research site, understand if there is genetic variation in those traits and then look to see if how those traits are related to other traits that are already part of breeding programs in, in industry. And particularly these days, very exciting part of it is that the work that meat scientists do and animal production scientists do in terms of developing technologies to make those traits easy to measure both in, on research sites and most particularly on farms and, and in processing plants as well. So it is good to be across so many areas, but sometimes I think I'm probably a little bit deficient and, and need a lot of help from people. Oh, well, I'm sure you do such a great job, Sue. I, I really enjoy working with you and it, I think a lot of our team does as well. And a lot of the work that you've done is absolutely amazing, which is why I've got you on the podcast today. I've definitely got a few questions up my sleeve, but... I guess going back to the start, like why agriculture? Why I just I'm curious as to where your starting point was with all this. Like, what made you want to study agriculture? Why genetics? Like, take me back in time. It is going back in time for me. But when I was at school, I was reading history. I was quite interested in Australian history at the time. Probably not too much of the hard history, but just general stories about early Australia. And and that made an impact on me about the importance of agriculture and particularly from some of what I was reading, the importance of the wool industry. 
So as I was leaving school, I thought I wanted to, in the country, I, I'm an outlier in terms of some of the researchers and, and people you've spoken to on this podcast in that I, I grew up in Sydney, had no real connection to the land. So it was a, a bit of a, a leap. So having thought that it'd be good to work in the country, I obviously need to to work there. And given that I had had this idea that agriculture was important to Australia and its economy, that I would study agriculture at, at university. So that's where I headed to. I did wool and pastoral sciences at Un- University of New South Wales. There, so there was able to focus more on livestock production and particularly wool production and, and sheep production. And as well was able to undertake genetic subjects, which led me to then going on to do a PhD looking at how index selection works when you restrict responses in in one of the breeding objective traits. So that's how I came to be trained, ready to live in the country, so to speak. And then I was fortunate to be appointed to uh, positions at Trangy, where I started with the department and and then more recently now based in Armidale. Okay, so you've been basically at Trangy since you started, essentially. essentially. Essentially, so that was an excellent place, particularly when, when I first went there. There were quite a number of young people, both in the technical stream and as researchers there at Trangy across a number of different disciplines, animal sciences, animal genetics, as well as agronomy and, and soil science. So there was a, a mix of, of people, obviously some older researchers, more, more experienced, but as well a nice blend of young and old. So it was an exciting period. And then as time went on, becoming involved in, in some of the key projects that the, the department had in sheep breeding. So there was the DFLOC project, which looked at variation between merino bloodlines and within merino bloodlines for a whole range of wool production traits, a huge project that led to many of DPI's following projects, including the combined weather trial analysis led by Kevin Atkins. There was also the Q plus demonstration selection lines on selection joint selection for fleece weight and fibre diameter, two antagonistic traits which demonstrated that could select simultaneously for fleece weight and diameter across different merino strains and within different merino strains. And also one of the, um, the early demonstrations of how breeding values could work in practice in, within a selection index in, in improving production of merinos. Then I, my interest in meat quality and eating quality, quality came with my association with the sheep CRCs and um, being involved in analyses of the meat production and quality data from, from that particular flock. And then more recently, that work is focused on eating quality in in merinos and how that can be included in breeding programs and how how it can be improved. That's so interesting. It sounds like you've worked through a whole lot of sheep genetics projects from when you started till now, which must be really interesting to look back on and see the advancements as well and how far things have come since, yeah, you first started, which must be really, really interesting I guess talking about merinos and eating quality, I I was reading one of your papers recently, actually, and I had a fair few questions from it because it seems like a really interesting topic. I guess I'm interested as well. Can you talk to me a bit more about the significance of considering eating quality traits in merino breeding objectives? Yes, merino ewes contribute significantly to land production in Australia. About around 30% of merino ewes are mated to to produce crossbred lambs. So simply based on that, it, it, you would say that it is important to, to understand what is happening in the merino in terms of the breeding programs that are applied there and how it would impact on production of lamb in, in crossbred systems. So we, we know that in terminal size systems, work by Andrew Swan and colleagues at AGBU have, have developed terminal size indexes that, that incorporate eating quality. So that we know that there are breeding programs available to industry that improve lean, lean meat yield as well as eating quality in those in terminal size systems. So it is, is reasonable to think that we understand what happens from merino breeding programs. And if, 
there are opportunities, particularly where merinos are in dual purpose production systems, to be able to understand and, if needed, ensure that those merinos being bred for dual purpose production, that their breeding objectives are consistent with those for used for internal sires. So for that, that reason, it's important to understand what happens to meat quality and eating qualities in, in merino sheep. Interesting. That's really, sounds like a really quickly evolving space as well to have that dual purpose animal, especially if you're doing a fair bit of research into it. I guess I'm interested as well, like, are there any sort of unfavorable responses when you're trying to improve eating quality when it comes to merino breeding? Like, how do you kind of balance the wool and the the eating quality at the same time? Is that, Yeah. yeah, tell me a bit more about that. When when we've looked at data from the information of nucleus flock, when we just focus on the, on the merino only data, as well as later data from AWI's Merino Lifetime Productivity Project, what we find is that breeding programs that focus on wool production, there should be negligible to small changes in meat quality, and also from our later work, only small changes in eating quality as well from breeding programs focused on wool production. So at the moment, there for those particular breeding programs, production systems, that there's little effect of selecting on wool traits, fleece weight, diameter, for example, on the meat quality and eating quality traits. In this case, the eating quality traits are intramuscular fat, shear force, and also, which are measured by objective means, and also sensory eating quality traits, which are based on consumer assessments of, of a range of different aspects from tasting samples of meat. So with the other aspects of merino breeding programs, if there's an emphasis on selecting for meat yield, lean meat yield, there will be impacts on intramuscular fat, shear force, and also it's likely to also impact on lean meat on uh, sensory eating quality characteristics, tenderness, juiciness, flavour and overall liking of the lamb meat. So is that kind of where the index has come into play is you kind of pick what you want, for example, the dual purpose, and then it kind of balances those unfavourable relationships or anything like that to kind of make sure you have the best chance of getting the animal that you want? Is that kind of how it works? Yes, it is. That Once you've defined your, your breeding objective and, and identified the, the information you can use to predict breeding values for those traits, then you can develop the, inf- the index using as well economic values so that you can achieve improvement in the range of traits and achieve responses that allow gains to be made in the direction that you want them to go for each of the traits. So to be able to improve lean meat yield, to be able to maintain or improve wool production, quality of wool production, as well as the eating quality of the lamb produced from merinos. This mirrors what Andrew Swan has done with the terminal sire indexes being able to select for antagonistically related traits in the breeding objective, and as well goes back to Q plus selection lines that I mentioned earlier, where they were a demonstration of being able to, to select for traits that are antagonistically related, being able to, to improve production as well as quality of production at the same time. That's so so cool that you get you've worked on it basically from you first started that must be a really interesting way to look back and see oh yeah the work that I did back in Changi when I first started on the Q plus to now that contribution must be really really rewarding to have a look back on it 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 is indeed because it it's like I would say most people in the work that they do you build on what has gone before what other people have done and um, what you do yourself and also build on the 
development of technologies. When I first started at Changi, computers were the size of a small room for, for the work that we did. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, they're laptops, so yeah. that's an amazing development, the computing power that we now have. In the paddock, one of the other big breakthroughs has been electronic identification system, EID tags, going from back in the early days of training to small metal tags that were applied to the ears, to the tags to today that can identify animals by simply scanning them with the, a reader to tags that have sensors mm. embedded in them today. So the process of just building and building on all sorts of technology that improve agriculture and in my case in particular sheep breeding. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting when you put it into perspective, just how big of a change has occurred from them and I'm assuming all to make life easier as well. Mm. And that's ongoing because particularly in meat quality and eating quality area, it's moving into processing plants where intramuscular fat can be measured in the processing plant using devices such as MEQ probe and SOMA infrared device. So that's a huge breakthrough in taking a laboratory measurement of intramuscular fat into the plant and being able to provide firstly feedback directly to producers about intramuscular fat levels in the carcasses that they produce, but also that information starts to flow back into Mm -hmm. genetic evaluation systems run by sheep genetics. So, and as people would know, it's constantly evolving the tools that we have available to us to apply in, in sheep breeding. Absolutely. And it sounds like there's just always new work coming out. And as you said, being built upon amazing work. Going back to the the eating quality stuff that we were talking about a little bit before, I'm curious as to what the average overall liking scores differed across the different cuts of Merino lamb. Yeah. So can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, we had a project, as I said, based on AWI's Marine Lifetime Productivity Project, where we took the weathers and finished them and had them slaughtered. From the carcasses of those weathers, we we sampled three different cuts of of lamb, the loin, knuckle and top side. So loin, a high value cut, whereas the uh, knuckle and top side are are lower value and, and are taken from the hind leg of the animal. So looking at overall liking of the loin, the average was about a score of 69. So zero is liked at all well, up to 100 very much liked. Whereas for knuckle, the, the average score was about 65 on a scale of zero to 100. And for top side, it was about 54. So okay. the overall liking does vary between the lamb cuts. Your high value cut, as expected, has higher overall liking, whereas your top side has the lowest value. And how would those kind of liking scores compare to like the average of a terminal meat breed? They're reasonably consistent with, with what was found in the information nucleus box. So the overall likings for merinos are about the same level that was found in the information nucleus box. So they're not very different at all. Okay, that's really, really interesting. And so I guess if there was somebody who did want to start improving their eating quality as a merino breeder, what sort of key messages do you think, taking away from this study or I guess your research in general on eating quality, what key messages would you have for those sort of producers or even if it's just where to start, some tips, yeah. kind of what, yeah. what would you say? Well, looking at improving eating quality can be done is, is the first message. We know that it's heritable, that is that there is genetic variation in intramuscular fat and we would expect that given the information we have on terminal size. There's an heritability of intramuscular fat is high at around 50% in merinos. We know that heritability of shear force is low, but there is still genetic variation and phenotypic variation in that trait. Eating quality traits, whether it's in uh, loin, knuckle or topside cuts, the eating quality traits of tenderness, flavour, juiciness, overall liking are all heritable. They're low to moratorium value, but you can still select for them. So the first thing is, yes, they can be changed by selection, so we should be able to improve them in, in breeding programs. The next point is that we're starting to understand the relationship of those eating quality traits with other production traits in, import in, in merino production systems. As I said before, wool production traits, changing those should result in or small changes in the eating quality traits. So with index selection, 
action, we should be able to account for those and develop indexes that will allow improvement in all the traits that we wish to improve. And if we have breeding programs that focus more on improving meat production traits, then we do need to have some emphasis on improvement of eating quality in the breeding program. As people would know, sheep genetics does provide Australian sheep breeding values for intramuscular fat and shear force, and they are available for merino. So producers, commercial producers and ram breeders have the ability to use that information in their breeding programs. And it is important to use that information because among the current merino select indexes, the dual purpose index would lead to small changes in intramuscular fat and shear force. So it is important to pay some attention focus on these traits in breeding programs. The other part of our, our work that we've done is looked at the impact of changing the breeding values of size for, for traits like clean fleece weight in yearlings and adults, fibre diameter, staple length, yearling body weight, adult body weight, yearling eye muscle depth, yearling fat depth, from ultrasound scanning. We've looked at if we change one of those breeding values by, by one unit, what would happen to the eating overall life in the loin, top side and knuckle cuts. And what we found is those relationships are negligible. We did not find any significant regressions of the eating quality traits on the side breeding values. So that's another piece of information that tells us that the relationships between traits, the genetic correlations are not going to be strong Mm -hmm. and so that makes it easier for us to design breeding programs that can incorporate improvements in wool production and quality, improvements in meat production, meat yield, as well as improving eating quality of the lamb produced and doing that across cuts. Because if we improve, for example, overall liking in the lamb loin cut, we'll also improve it in both the top side Mm. and knuckle cuts because of very high genetic correlations between overall liking in each of the cuts. So what we do in terms of improving loin overall liking will also improve overall liking in those other cuts and also correlations among the eating quality traits so if we improve overall liking we'll also improve tenderness juiciness and flavor of the lamb cut okay that's really really interesting to know and i feel very helpful for people who would want to start improving their eating quality and potentially might have all of these breeding values and wonder which one to start selecting for but it's interesting to know that you know those relationships if you start to pick one the others will likely increase or better with that and it sounds like indexes are a great tool to get started and really highlight how important it can be to use them particularly when I guess there are a lot of traits to consider especially if you are going for a a dual purpose animal so they sound incredibly useful for people to utilize to their benefit bigger picture question so (laughs) you've been working for dpi for a little while now and you've done some amazing work but i'm curious so let's say we had a crystal ball and we could look into the future say 10 years down the track what do you see changing or what do you see being the next big thing i'm curious as to to pick your thoughts on that oh there could be so many things that do change (laughs) in the future and i think that the One would be just seeing where the DNA technologies, for someone like me, whose expertise is not so much in that molecular genetics area, where those technologies take us in terms of being able to understand the genetic variation that underpins the traits that that are part of breeding programs in industry flocks. At the moment, we're using genomic information-based chips, so... Where that goes to will be very interesting and how that will influence the sampling of the animals, the information that goes through through to genetic evaluation systems and how that information gets back back to breeders. Um, to me, that will be interesting. But I guess that having seen the impact of technologies, the supporting technologies on how to conduct breeding programs in practically I'm really interested to see where sensors and the electronic technologies take us in terms of being able to monitor animals remotely 
and in real time in the paddock to Mm -hmm. start to include some of the welfare and and other sustainability traits in, in breeding programs. At the moment, there's... There's certainly a, a fair bit of work done, being done on reducing methane emissions and, and having a methane trait in, in breeding programs. And, and that is in itself an interesting trait to see how that will progress in terms of being a trait that can be measured far more easily. So remove it from that hard to measure category and have it being able to be measured cost effectively and more routinely in industry flocks and I see that moving as well to the eating quality aspects as well eating quality to to assess it by using consumer taste panels is an expensive and time consuming as well process so to be able to automate that and that's already started to happen with automating intramuscular fat measurements but can we do that with shear force as well Mm. because that is the other part of of the eating quality of of meat cuts it's not just the flavor the juiciness it's also the tenderness that experiences as we first bite into a, a piece of lamb so i'm interested to see how measurements that we currently do now as laboratory measurements how as well as things that are developing because there's always research being done to be able to understand how animals function how those measurements developed by our animal scientists and nutritionists meat scientists how they progress into being out of the hard to measure traits the expensive to measure traits into something that is really a tool that can be used within by um, producers and ram breeders to use in their breeding programs. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things there, Sue. I it's made me excited for what the next ten years might hold too. And I think I'm yeah I'm interested to see what happens with the sustainability sort of work as well. It seems to be a really hot topic, so it's going to be a very exciting watch this space. I think it is indeed. Well, thanks so much, Sue, for coming onto the podcast today. It's been a really great sit down and chat with you. And I've loved hearing about all of the the eating quality work you've done. It sounds like it's going to continue to grow and evolve. And I'm really excited to potentially sit down with you again and see where things continue to go. Thank you, Emily. I look forward to that. No worries. Thanks, Sue. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. I hope you found our discussion as enlightening as I did. This episode was produced by the extensive livestock genetics team within the New South Wales government. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to our podcast on your favourite platform, leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends and colleagues. Your feedback and support help us grow and reach more people who are passionate about livestock genetics. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future topics or people you'd like to hear on the show, please feel free to reach out to me on emily.johnston at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au. Thanks again for listening and until next time.